Welcome to episode two of Oil Painting Q&A. Um, we've got some great questions from viewers uh, from last week's uh, episode, and I'm going to get into those in a minute. But before I do, I wanted to um, just teach a very quick lesson about detail um, and painting detail in paintings. This is a painting by Repin, which I love. It's one of my favorite artists. Beautiful portrait. You know, realism doesn't get any better than this, in my, in my opinion. But now let's zoom in and look at the beard and the collar. And I want you to put yourself in the, in the, pretend that this painting is sitting on your easel and you're a foot and a half away from it and you're trying to decide whether you want to keep working on the beard or not, or on the collar or not. And imagine the temptation you would feel. I mean, look at this up close. It looks nothing like a beard. It looks nothing like hair. There's no individual hairs anywhere. There's just no detail at all, but the values are right. The values are dead on. But imagine the temptation you would feel after you painted these smudges of black and brown, and you're trying to decide whether you need to work on it anymore. The thing about all these great artists is that they, they get their values right, meaning the darks are as dark as they should be, the intermediates are where they need to be, the highlights are not brighter than they need to be, the values are right where they should be. So, let's take a look at another one. This is by Anton Mauve, and it's a nice little landscape, but now let's zoom in and look at the houses in the distance, and notice how little detail there is. There's no doors or windows or anything, it's just a bunch of black paint with a few smudges of lighter color next to it, but the values are right. And what you see from a distance are homes in a little village or whatever it is, and yet when you look at it up close, there's just nothing but smudges and black. Just nothing there at all, almost. But his values are right. This is by Paul Gabriel. Notice the train off in the distance in this pretty little landscape. And now let's zoom in and look how he really painted the train. Imagine if you had just painted the train, just as he had. And imagine the temptation you'd feel to go in and put a bunch of detail all over it, which wouldn't be necessary, would probably throw your values off in the process. So it's just smudges of black, the little smokestack is crooked, no one notices, no one cares, and from a distance it's wonderful. It's because the, the eye cares about value and it doesn't care about detail. Let's look at one last one. This is by Abbott Thayer, one of my favorite artists again. And if you'll uh, look at the top of the vase when we zoom in, and imagine you've, you're painting this vase. And imagine, the, again, the temptation you'd feel to go in and polish it up and smooth it out and make the detail all look pretty. And yet, what matters is the values. And he's got his values all exactly where they need to be. So that's a little lesson about uh, painting detail and to always focus on value and you can paint as sloppy as you want. You can have any kind of brushwork that you want. There's, uh, you know, all different styles of brushwork. But if your values are right, you can get away with anything. Okay, let's get into viewers' questions. Who are your favorite artists? Um, that's a good question. Um, before I uh, let me let me make a distinction. Um, there's there's two two ways that I appreciate art. One is. Um, the uh, John Singer Sargent, for instance, or Repin, the Russian artist, uh, th those are guys that I feel like were painting realism as good as you can paint realism. I mean, if, if you wanted to hire somebody to paint your daughter or, or your son, you would, you would hire Sargent or Repin to do it because they, would, they, they were an eye. They could paint what they see, and they did it with a, with a real strength that... that um, you know, it's just very, very rare, rare. And so I really appreciate Sargent and Repin. And, and there's a whole, you know, there's, I could name 10, 10 artists that paint in that style. Um, but on the other hand, um, my appreciation for art, uh, when I'm not thinking about brushwork or I'm not thinking about anything other than just how a, an image uh, uh, has an impact on me in, a, in, a, in some, you know, positive way generally. Um, and in, in that case, I have a, a different list of artists that I love. Uh, George Ennis is, is one of my favorite. Um, and he's a, primarily a landscape artist, um, but I, I just absolutely love his work, even, even though a lot of it is, like this one here, is, is, is almost surreal. 
Uh, Mark Rothko is a modern artist that I love. I, I can't explain to you why I like him. It would be like trying to explain why I like clouds in the sky. I mean, it's it's just uh, something about his work that that just that affects me. I, I can't explain it. Um, and another artist that I love, uh, and, and this is just a one particular painting, um, although I like several of his work, but this painting hangs in the Metropolitan Museum by Frederick Edwin Church, and it is just, uh, you know, it just doesn't get any better in terms of uh, painting a landscape that, that, that actually looks like, you know, what that view would look like. And I just think it's just an, an incredible achievement to have painted this painting. And uh, I love it. Uh, Andrew Wyeth is one of my favorite. Uh, he's a, a hardcore realist, um, but um, I think that his the mood that he captures, you know, Andrew Wyeth, it's all about subject matter. And um, I just absolutely love the effect that he gets, the, the, the melancholy, you know, whatever it is, it just really seems very sincere and not the slightest bit artificial, and I, I just love it. Um, and then Edward Hopper, uh, one of my very favorites. Um, and you know, I, I don't appreciate um, Hopper's brushwork. I don't think it's anything that I really like. Um, in fact, I you know he, I don't think he could even paint a face. You know, at at the highest level, there, there's nothing about his work. His colors are off. But I absolutely love his his work. Um, he has a way with color and a way with uh, subject matter and a way of pro creating these moods that I love. And this painting right here um, is one of my very favorite. As a child, I still remember looking through my father's art book and being moved by this, this painting. And I can't even tell you why, but it's just that, that sort of slice of life, um, you know, melancholy mood that he creates. Please share your ideas about color blindness and painting. Um, I can't say with, with all certainty that, that it's not a big deal, but I really don't think it's a big deal at all. Um, I think that value is number one, and, and you can go, and even if you were completely colorblind and could only see in black and white, for instance, that you could still paint paintings that were very appealing and had wonderful, um, you know, it might even be, and this sounds crazy, but sometimes when you if you don't know the color and you're only focusing on the values that you'll end up with some real interesting mixes of color and and things that people normally wouldn't have painted but I feel very strongly that if your values are right that you can do no wrong and um, so I and I and personally I've taught a few people that had minor color blindness and they don't didn't seem to have any trouble at all so it's, it's as bizarre as it sounds, I just don't think it matters that much. I think that you just have to go forward and whatever the color is that you see, you know, if your colors are shifted one way or another a little bit, it's not a big deal. What approach do you recommend to a student who desires to wean themselves from color checking? Uh, very simple, just don't do it, period. I mean, just, just do the best you can. Um, and I think that you'll be surprised if you've been uh, painted four or five paintings with a color checker, and I would do at least that many before you do wean yourself from it. But um, you'll be amazed at how good you are compared to before you ever did any color checking at all. But ultimately, you know, it doesn't matter whether your colors are dead on perfect. What matters is whether it works or not. And I think that a lot of that is going to come by instinct. But the only way you can stop uh, using the color checker is just, just, just don't do it. Just do the best you can. And you'll be amazed. Um, one of my students, um, she was uh, doing a workshop. And for whatever reason, uh, she had done my method. She'd done a lot of color checking. And he wanted her to paint a landscape in 20 minutes. And it turned out just fantastic. Couldn't have been better. And she didn't do any color checking at all. So uh, that's my advice. Can alizarin crimson be mixed with cadmium red deep and permanent rose paint? Uh, no, actually it cannot. Um, it's just a, whenever you get into those really dark colors, you've got to use a permanent alizarin or a color like permanent alizarin. Um, the the uh, cadmiums instantly will raise the value much lighter, so you, can't, you just can't get to those deep, dark blood reds that you can get with uh, permanent alizarin 
or some of the lake colors, um, but the cadmiums just won't do it, too bright. Is drawing a talent or something that can be learned? It positively can be learned. I've taught several people who say they couldn't draw a stick figure and they've learned to draw fantastic. Basically, there are, there are certain people, uh, like myself, when I was a kid, I kind of naturally had an ability to see proportion, and, and I can't really explain to you what that was, but it was just when I, whenever I looked at anything, I, I saw it as, you know, well, the head is bigger, and, and I kind of would measure, and I kind of had a natural uh, instinct to do that, which I don't know where that comes from, but I've taught several people that just really didn't have a clue, just, just didn't have any idea about how to uh, draw. But it's just a matter of learning to see in proportion and to learn to translate the 3D world into 2D, and it's very, very simple. Uh, I teach uh, using a proportional divider, which is a fantastic tool because it breaks everything down to simple proportions. And um, if you want to get into the details of how I teach uh, to paint, you can go to the online course on drawmixpaint.com, and all, all the instruction is there. What other forms of art have you experimented with, and which was your favorite? Um, I play a lot of drums, or used to play a lot of drums. I don't play as much anymore. Um, really enjoy that. I, I like improvisational jazz uh, drumming. Um, what I really like doing, I guess, more than anything, uh, as far as art goes, is doing um, designing of uh, furniture and working with wood. Um, I really enjoyed designing this artist easel. That was a lot of fun. Um, but that's about it as far as uh, stuff that I'm actively um, experimented with. I'm interested in trying the Geneva paint for landscapes, but know at times I have to work in layers. For example, trees in front of sky. How would I adhere to the fat over lean rule? Would I add linseed oil? I work in miniature and linseed oil is a bit thick for me. Um, yes, just add a few drops of uh, linseed oil uh, to, to, the, uh, to the Geneva paint uh, that's gonna go on, you know, on the second layer um, and that'll get your uh, oil percentage up just a little bit and that way you'll be adhering to fat over lean. Uh, and that's exactly as you would do with, with, it, with any oil paint. Um, and also regarding the working in miniature, I have, I've never worked in miniature before, so I'm not really that familiar with it and, and you know, the, the technical difficulties that it presents. Um, as far as, um, I don't know, the, the refined linseed oil is pretty thin. I don't know if you're talking about stand oil perhaps, but uh, then again, I haven't worked in miniature, so I'm not really sure how things, how paint performs at those scales. But the Geneva paint is actually quite thin. It's, it's heavily loaded with pigment, but it's, it's quite thin because uh, that's the way I like it. It has a real nice flow to it on, on the canvas. I'd be interested to see uh, what you think about working in miniature. Is there any special preparation for painting during the summer season? In India, I usually stop painting in summer as paint used to dry very fast, even if I use slow dry medium. Uh, secondly, would you explain how to remove glare from my color checker? Um, as far as painting during the summer, um, I think that uh, the, the issue is is that you can only put so much oil of cloves and burn umber, and uh, the limit is about if you put in a, enough oil of cloves, you can get about a seven to to ten day drying time, and any more than that, it's just it's just getting to the point where you're adding way too much uh, oil of cloves. Although I don't know that there's anything detrimental about that. But the, the thing is, is that when you're adding the slow dry medium, there's some other things in there that are really helping the handling properties of the paint, the leveling and, and, and everything else. And so uh, if, if it, it becomes, if you add so much oil of cloves, you're not able to get all those other good things in your medium that, uh, that are in the slow dry medium. So, so really beyond uh, you know, painting in real heat, there's just as far as I know, that if you're gonna use burn umber or any of the umbers or earth colors, uh, you, you just, there's just nothing you can do. You just have to either find a cool place to paint or as you say, or paint very quickly. Um, that's, that's the other thing you can do. Uh, regarding the uh, getting glare off of the color checker, um, if you hold out your color checker 
and just visualize this sound. This is a funny way to explain glare, but just imagine that your eyes are shooting out ping pong balls in a straight line and they're not affected by gravity. And so wherever you look, you're shooting ping pong balls. The ping pong balls are going to bounce just like light into your source of glare. So therefore, if you're holding out a color checker, if you can imagine a ball hitting that that little half moon area where you put your paint and where is that ball going to bounce and where that ball bounces is where the lights coming from and where your glare is coming from so therefore if you hold out your color checker just beyond you and up you're going to find if there's a window or a bright uh, wall or, or just anything bright that's going to create glare on your color checker and it's something you definitely need to deal with Love your videos. I just wanted to know, how did you work your way up to paint the president? Huge accomplishment. Um, I'm going to save that for another uh, discussion. Um, it's a long story. <laughs> um, it's a, you know, a, lot of, a lot of luck, a lot of uh, things just going my way. Um, and anyway, I'll, I'll save that story for another day. Your portrait work has a real photographic quality to it, a very high level of realism but your landscape work is far less so, quite loose almost, which I prefer. Why is that? Does your technique change at all when doing landscapes? Uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, when I first started painting portraits, well, when I first started, I was very detailed and uh, didn't learn how to loosen it up until I copied a sergeant painting. Um, but then once in my early career painting portraits, um, I had a much looser stroke, and that was the way I actually preferred to paint. And the reason I got more and more photographic as my career went forward was uh, it was just a simple, um, you know, I, I sort of started getting burnt out with portraiture. I lost some of my passion and dealing with clients, it's just a lot easier to, to give the client a real sharp uh, representation of their child or their wife or husband because um, the, the looser you paint, the, the more ab there's more likely they're going to see a funny, the nose look funny or the mouth look funny. Um, you know, it reminds me of uh, uh, John Singer Sargent had a, a, a great quote, which I don't know exactly, but basically it was a, a portrait is a likeness with a little something funny about the mouth and that and that that is very very true and the more photographic you make it and the more exact you are um, the less issues you have with clients and that's why I tended to tighten up as my career went on what are a few of the most important tips for artists who are just beginning their career um, we have a, a, a course an online course it's it's all free all the material is free. There's some uh, links to some longer videos, but you don't even have to purchase those videos. All the core instruction is there. But the course on drawmixpaint.com, it really goes through the whole process and teaches my method from the very beginning to the very end. It's all you need. I mean, it covers everything, all the details. So just go to drawmixpaint and start with step one and go through the whole thing. That's the, how you learn. Um, now, as far as your career goes and getting into galleries, if you're talking about that part of it, um, the number one thing, and I need to do a whole video on, on you know, how to make a living as an artist, but the, the thing that I see again and again is that people lose their focus. And the number one thing you, should, you need to focus on is the quality of your work. So you're always trying to improve. You're always, you're always focusing on painting your next masterpiece. And because if you're not painting at the level of the top guys, and you can go on the internet and find those top realists that, that you love, and when you see those, the guys that are you know, selling everything that they paint and, and are getting a good price for their work and they're in the big galleries, um, they're, without exception, they're all, uh, all very, very good. Okay? Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about modern art. I'm not talking about um, you know, all the various isms. But in terms of good realism, realism like John Singer Sargent or, or you know, that, that style of realism, which, by the way, sells pretty well, um, if you can paint at that level, the galleries, you're going to find galleries that will, will hang your work. It's that simple. But a lot of people, they, they, they get their focus and they start thinking, well, I need to win shows and I need to enter this and I need to get a resume together or maybe even need to, to go and, and um, go 
you know, to formal education, but you don't need any of that. The, the galleries are really looking for great artwork, and so keep your focus on that instead of all the other things that can distract you. In the original Carter Method video series, your training was constantly interrupted by background noises from peacocks or seagulls. The question is, have you already hunted and eaten the peacocks? Thanks, I really need to know. Uh, no, I never hunted the peacocks. That was an old studio that was out in the country, and we had uh, not only peacocks, but free-range chickens and goats and, and all kinds of uh, things that were constantly interrupting our video. <laughs> um, the worst part about it was catching all the roosters um, before we could even start filming and putting them in the barn because they were... Uh, they would otherwise they would they would crow and and um, ruin the, the video. Why did you decide to sell Geneva paint in jars as opposed to tubes? I can understand the use of jars when we're mixing our own medium, but wouldn't tubes be more convenient? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the reason that we put it in tubes is normally uh, when paint comes in tubes, it's very stiff, and this goes back to you know traditional paint, even traditional paint back you know 30 40 years ago it was much more common to open up a tube and a little bit of oil would would flow out of the tube and that's because they weren't putting all the stabilizers in it that they do now um, with the Geneva paint we don't put anything in it specifically to to uh, keep the oil from separating out and because it adversely affects the handling properties so if we put it in tubes um, you wouldn't be able to stir it up before you used it and you would squeeze it out and the oil would run everywhere and so that's why we put it in jars. And here's a couple of uh, related questions. The first one is, have you ever tried ac acrylic paints and what do you like better about oils than acrylics? And the second question, which is related, is oil is an expensive medium, so learning how to paint in oil gets really costly. Does painting in acrylics also improve your skill in oils at the same time, or is there a big difference which keeps you limited? Uh, very good question. Um, First of all, let me just say that the, the very, very big difference between oils and acrylics is uh, acrylics dry just extremely fast, you know, in hours. And oil, uh, especially um, traditional old oils that, uh, without all the, the heavy dryers in it, will dry in, you know, as long as like a week. So there's a huge difference, and, beca and therefore, I, I mean, if you told me to paint a portrait with acrylic, I would just, it would be a major handicap to me. I don't even know how I would do it. It would be extremely difficult because the paint would be drying on me, and when you, dry, when you take a, a, some dried paint and then take some wet paint and try to blend into it, it's completely different. You get chalky uh, intermediates. You have to sort of rub the canvas and a little bit and not put too much paint. It's just a completely different thing than working wet into wet. And, um, but I haven't uh, painted with acrylic, so I don't have a lot of uh, experience with it. I absolutely love oils because of the range. Um, and I think they're easier to paint with. Um, I'm, a lot of people think acrylics are easy, but I think that comes from the fact that they're sort of ready to use and you just get water and you paint with them. But once you get set up with your oils, it's actually easier to paint what you see with oil than it is with acrylics, um, as far as I know. Um, of course, again, I haven't uh, painted with acrylics. Uh, there's a great uh, YouTube channel. Uh, if you if you type in Schaefer Art and uh, check out his art, he does a, he he's done a lot of acrylic painting a, in the past and and has a lot of discussion about it. And you might enjoy um, seeing his his channel. And I think he's actually um, now experimenting with oil, so he might have something to say on that topic. Well, that's about all the time we have uh, for this show. Um, if you have any questions for me that you'd like to answer, put them in the comment section of this video, and I will uh, try to get to them next Thursday. Thank you very much for watching, and see you later.